This is Montage with your host, Ralph Rennick. Tonight on Montage, we'll see how local school officials, doctors, and coaches are trying to make high school football a safer game. And we'll join Joe Abril for an interview with Rock Hudson. But first, Montage has found a remarkable woman living in Miami, a woman who values all her senses. Helen Gribbs leads a relatively normal life. She goes grocery shopping, reads the newspaper, sews, and occasionally splurges on new clothes. Helen does all this in total darkness and without hearing a sound. She was born deaf and with poor eyesight 69 years ago. She grew up in New York City and spent 12 years of her childhood in the Lexington School for the Deaf. Besides basic studies, Helen was taught how to speak, although her words are still muffled today. Helen wanted to live at home and work with her father in a tailor shop. She enrolled in the Hirsch Trade School to refine her sewing skills, but her vision was slowly deteriorating. Helen knew she had to study Braille and learn to walk with a cane or she'd become totally dependent on others. She worked in New York, living at home, until six years ago when her mother died. Then Helen, at the age of 63, decided to move to Miami and share an apartment with a girlfriend who was also deaf but who could see. After three years, Helen decided she needed more privacy and moved into a one-room efficiency. A year later, she went totally blind. Helen communicates with people who don't know sign language. She puts out her hand so letters can be written in her palm. We used that method when Helen made a lunch of ham and cheese sandwiches for the montage camera crew and some of her friends. But she wasn't concentrating on the conversation. She was trying not to bump into furniture or make any kind of mistake that could be captured by our cameras. After feeding six people, Helen needed to go grocery shopping. She felt her braille watch for the time and then walked four blocks, tapping her cane at corners for someone to take her across the street. She has visual memory. She knows what the world looked like, which is an enormous advantage for any person who's blind. I'm sure anybody who's blind doesn't think of blindness as being an advantage. But as far as having visual memory, it helps. If you watch her, you see that she turns to you and looks at you. And she's thinking about you. As she's walking down a sidewalk, you'll see her turn her head. Because she's near a driveway, she feel a ramp. And she'll turn her head. She's thinking driveway, ramp, sidewalk. I'm sure she pictures all the parking meters in her mind, and that's how she travels smoothly. The difference would be incredible if she wasn't doing that. She'd be zigzagging and bouncing off of things, and she doesn't. Helen does make a few wrong turns. When that happens, she patiently searches for landmarks and tries again. Dave Askenaz has been helping the deaf-blind woman shop at food fair for six years. Helen tells Dave what she needs, and he pulls her grocery cart. I communicate with her by writing on the palm of her hand the, the prices of, of the items, and I, um, I help her. Uh, she, uh, she go, I go to each uh, shelf and help her pick out what she needs. She writes everything on a pad so that I understand. And uh, she also can talk a little bit, because uh, if she doesn't want something, she'll tell me she, do she doesn't want it. No, it's too much. Or if she wants a smaller, uh, smaller package of, of, uh, of the item, I, I, uh, I give her a smaller package. Helen pays the cashier with bills folded in distinct ways so she can recognize their denominations. Then she walks back to her apartment, carrying her groceries three flights up the stairs. She relies on her social security check to pay for the groceries but she can't afford the training she's receiving at Miami's Lighthouse for the Blind. So the Office of Blind Services, a state agency, picks up the tab. Helen comes here practically every afternoon to practice skills. <laughs> Helen's sewing lab is in the next room. She told instructor Kathy Funk that today she wanted to be the teacher. Yeah, I am 
Helen shows Kathy how easy it is to make a little girl's dress from a pillowcase when a saucer is used to trace necklines and armholes. It's amazing to think that Helen can't hear or see what she's sewing, yet she strives for perfection. Uh-huh, right, right, that's good, right. Helen is very exact and thorough when she sews, and she can tell when something isn't just right, and if something isn't just right, then she'll take it out and do it again and, and keep on doing it until it's right. And so I don't need to tell her, no, that isn't good, but she can figure it out for herself and um, figure out the solutions, too. Helen uses her mind as well as her hands. She reads the New York Times weekly Braille edition and has been carefully following the presidential race. Hi, Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter. Why? Because I am Democrat. Democrat. Okay. While we were talking politics, Southern Bell was installing a teletypewriter in Helen's apartment. She dials the number of someone who has one of these machines, then types out a message. Helen's words are read in Braille on the other end. When she receives a call, a fan attached to the typewriter blows air on her. She goes over to the machine and reads the Braille printout. Ellie Dupree phoned Helen that night from the lighthouse. She thought she'd be thrilled to get a phone call. Instead, Helen told Ellie, very matter-of-factly, that she had company over and thought it was rude to start sending messages. Helen hung up. We asked Helen to make a call, and she dialed the lighthouse. She grinned when her hands felt the words, are you wearing a bikini for TV, Helen? And sometimes there's been a breakdown in communication between us because I said something, meaning it as a joke. And she wasn't sure it was a joke. Well, you know how after you're alone by yourself, you start saying, is that really a joke or did she mean it? And I think that that probably happens to her and she'll come back to me. She'll either be angry or, you know, healthily angry or she'll be uh, upset. And then we just go through it. You know, like any human relationship, you sometimes don't understand what happened and you fix it. After Helen hung up with the lighthouse, she told us she needed a pair of slacks and was going to take the bus to Learners. Helen wrote a note asking someone to make sure she gets on the right bus. She then showed the driver another note which read, Learners, please. Okay, okay. Is that right? The driver explained to Helen that he couldn't stop exactly at the corner where Learners was located but he would instead let her off a block early. Helen obviously didn't hear that and went to sit down. But Helen, cool and collected, found her way. She taps her cane and waits for a salesperson. She tells her she wants a pair of slacks. Helen felt her selection and decided she didn't like any of her choices. She's not afraid of being honest. She's also a particular and meticulous dresser. So when producer Nancy Solomon was saying goodbye to her, she began to lecture. Helen, what are you doing? That's a good idea. You fold it up. Okay, then what, do I, what do I do with this part there? Mm -hmm. OK. <laughs> the lady has style. That's Let's right. You're teaching it. me how to wear my clothes. Huh? OK. OK. Is that better? Right, you're right. I'm wrong. <laughs> that looks good, I know, it looks better than I had it. But, but Helen, you forgot about the shirt underneath. I can't let this cuff show there. What am I going to do with that? So, Helen dresses me in the morning. <laughs> you better check in here every day to see what I work with. It's too much. You're right, Helen. You're absolutely, she's much more stylish than I'll ever be. Okay. Ah! I thank you. Okay? <laughs> okay. Ready? Okay.
Ellen says she doesn't want sympathy. She's happy for what she has and what she's doing with her life. She said her only regret is that she's unable to watch or hear herself tonight on television. The 69-year-old woman walks proudly. She has a heart of gold and a will of iron. She's an inspiration for all of us who too often take our blessings for granted. Teletypewriters such as the one now installed in Helen's apartment are available for other deaf blind people. The Office of Blind Services and the Miami Lighthouse for the Blind urge South Floridians to call them and let them know of people who might need the machine or who might need some other kind of training. And now we have a report from Maury Oliker on another kind of disability that's especially tragic because it can be prevented. Greg Stead is probably Miami's best known quadriplegic. Five years ago this week, he became paralyzed from his shoulders down when he injured his neck making a tackle in a high school football game. He and his family sued the maker of the helmet Greg was wearing and won a $5.3 million damage award, which is still under appeal. The case was highly controversial. Dade school officials doubt that the helmet itself was responsible, citing instead dangerous blocking and tackling techniques. But the school system has adopted new rules for both helmets and training to reduce head and neck injuries. One thing that was done, of course, was the uh, National Federation has adopted a policy and some rules have been changed in our football rules that uh, prohibit not only spearing, which is a malicious act, but also prohibits butt blocking or face tackling, which is making primary contact with the head or the facial area. Uh, also significant is the fact that we will increase our efforts to ensure that our athletes have strengthen the programs for working on the neck musculature to make their neck as strong as possible. Uh, we have gone to a gradual conversion to a padded type helmet, which we feel offers better overall protection. And we have changed to the cage type face mask, which reduces the protrusion and therefore reduces the leverage and still maintains the significant protection to the facial area. Joe Brodsky, head football coach at Hialeah Miami Lake Senior High School, emphasizes that a helmet protects only the head. To protect his neck, a football player must be taught how to use his body properly. Brodsky also showed me how new padded helmets are an improvement over older suspension type helmets. What is a suspension helmet to begin with? Well, it's, uh, it's just what it looks like. It's just, it, your, your head is suspended in a, uh, I guess, a cloth type material and it is uh, kept off of the sides, kept from the front and the back, and uh, kept top to bottom. Uh, there's nothing uh, wrong with the suspension helmet, and these are there, there are new and old. Uh, we just felt in this county that we like the idea, uh, after dealing with orthopedic surgeons, we like the idea of having a padded helmet. Mm -hmm. uh, one other thing that we've done in the county, well, two other things, actually. Uh, we have gone away from a this type of face guard, even though it's not significant, uh, but we are saying we're going to go to this because it take away, it takes away the leverage. See how far this sticks out and how close this is to the helmet. And we feel that that's going to help uh, in the fact that you might get a leverage type situation on the helmet with this. Now we've also said that all new helmets bought in Dade County, this is a Dade County situation only, will have a four point chin strap. Uh, this is an example of one type. And what it does is it snugs the helmet to the head and does not allow it to rock. It's a much better situation than a one point where they do still rock. We feel that that's a significant difference that we in Dade County are going to use. But football is a dangerous game, and that's a fact that young players and their parents cannot forget. Well, we are dealing with a contact sport which involves large ball players moving at fast speeds. And as you know, energy is a relation between mass times the square of velocity. And the bigger the player, the faster he goes, the more energy he expends. And when you get two of them coming at each other, you got a tremendous amount of energy. So essentially what you're saying is that even in high school football, uh, injuries and, and this occasional risk of um, crippling is, is an inherent risk in the game. I think it's an inherent risk in whatever we do. 
uh, certainly in contact sports and maybe a little bit more than in other sports, but we see severe injuries in all aspects of sports medicine, not only football. Okay, good job. Good job. Keep your feet, though, and keep driving with men. Don't stop to make now, the man I'm with, uh, his real name is Roy Fitzgerald, but of course you know who it is, and you know his name that most of you know him by is not Roy Fitzgerald. Who gave you Rock Hudson? My head? agent. And you, what did you think about it? Did you debate about changing it? or? Well, his argument was that Fitzgerald was too long a name for the Marquis. <clears throat> and I said, all right, then I guess we can't use Barry Fitzgerald or Geraldine Fitzgerald or any of the any of the others he said well that's a good point except that how many Hudson's are there okay so I had to agree with that then he had submitted I don't know how many first names which were undigestible to me <laughs> and finally came up with rock and I thought okay to give up arguing but I still say, what's wrong with Roy Fitzgerald, you know? Yeah, well, you told me earlier that's still your legal name. Mm -hmm. Your mm -hmm. bank books are in that name, and your friends call you Roy. Mm -hmm. they don't, who calls you Rock? I guess strangers. Uh -huh. Strangers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, in this whole process of building up, was it, was it dehumanizing, do you think? Uh, did you feel like a pawn? You're being taught to dance and to sword Not at all. To... Not at all. I wanted to do it to learn my craft. Yeah. In other words... Quite the opposite would be dehumanizing. If you go in, if you're assigned a role, and you are assigned roles when you're to contract to a yeah. studio, and you go in to, uh, let's say, a Western, where you've got to be whoever dangerous Dan McGrew or whatever yeah. his name is, and you don't know how to ride, and yet you have to ride, that's dehumanizing. Right. So I learned how to ride, because I knew I was going to be in Westerns. Well, it came in handy. You were in a number of Westerns. But you know, being in public life like you are, being uh, constantly in the public eye, I read some pretty weird things about you in the fan magazines. Uh, have you ever filed a libel suit <laughs> for anything that's ever been written or said about you? Have you wanted to? And what, why didn't you? I've always wondered. Because it calls attention to it and only makes it worse. But, but shouldn't someone be called to accounting for doing those things? They should be. You know, I, I mean, we, I think our profession should, but we don't, it's difficult, but... There's a lesson you have to learn, uh, <clears throat> which I learned. You know, years ago, when I'd be written badly about, it used to hurt, really hurt, you know, think, why, what have I done to deserve this yeah. trash in, in, in print or, or what have you? And there's a very famous quote from Jack Warner to one of his stars who was very upset when they said, you know, listen to, the, look at this and look what they've written about me and blah, 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 blah. And he said, relax. It's tomorrow's toilet paper. Yeah, that's true. You probably but, can't use that either. But, well, sure, <laughs> why not? But it did take you a while to accept that. But you have to be, you have to sort of become calloused. Yeah. How long did it take you? Very quickly or, or were, did you used it to was be over, more sensitive? And it was over a period of years, yeah. yeah. If you had to go back and start all over again, would you be an actor? You bet. Would you? Mm. You don't regret any mm. of it. At 50, do you feel pretty well fulfilled as a man? Yes, I think so. And do you feel embarrassed about any of the early movies? Yes, quite a bit. Do you? Yeah, Why? yeah. Huh? Why? Because they're terrible. Well, and I was terrible in them. <laughs> no, you mean, you just, you hate to see the, the job of acting that you did. Yes, you see, I thought at the time. And... When I was young, I was very young. And I thought, this is really the last of the Red Hot Actors, you know. Yeah. And I look at it, and it's just dreadful. And it makes me realize how much I had to learn and have to learn, you know, still. Well, sure, learning is part of getting better in your craft. We all do that. I think in your case, though, do you think... Uh, the more serious roles you have begun to take uh, are kind of taking away from your image as a sex symbol? I hardly think you can be a sex symbol at 50. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yeah? Sure. Are you 50 mm. this year? Well, I certainly think you are to a lot of people. From what I've people have said to me when I said I was going to interview Rock Hudson, I asked to get right. autographs. and. Uh, 
maybe once a month. <laughs> now, don't you think, do you think you're a handsome man? No. You really don't? No. I mean, when you look in the mirror in the morning, you say, gee, what a kisser. This is, I wish my nose were different. I, I, that's hard for me to believe. The mirror is a liar in the first place. Yeah? Well, how does it lie to you? Well, you never see yourself as others see you. And the way you see yourself is totally unimportant. It's the way other people see you, I think. Uh, furthermore, I've seen this puss all my life. So it's, there's nothing. But you un undoubtedly perceive how people act towards you, uh, that they are in some, well, maybe you don't. Maybe, they, maybe you think people You mean in terms of like awe? Yeah. Like well, yeah, I understand a big that. Star, and, you know. I understand that because I have been in awe of whoever that may be, Catherine I, Hepburn. Well, that's funny. I heard uh, um, Joni Rivers say the other night that her friends, Carol Burnett and so forth, and, and I think she, maybe she mentioned you. She thinks of them as her friends. She, it's hard for her to re keep remembering that to the most of America, they are big stars. But mm -hmm. for her, they're people that uh, they see every day. Mm -hmm. So I guess for you to say Catherine Hepburn is, uh, you might ask for her autograph. You wouldn't no, ask for I just <laughs> go like that. Do you know her? I have met her. Couldn't say a word. Really? Couldn't say a word. Does she know that? Or maybe she thinks you're just a I don't shy. know. I don't know. I don't know whether she knows that or not. I hope not. Because I don't think she'd like that. Yeah, probably like you don't. I so know. don't tell anybody. No, we won't. We won't please everybody watching. Don't. <laughs> okay, we won't say anything. Uh, mum's the word, okay? I asked Gregory Peck this question. Uh, when you're back in Los Angeles at home, do you go out and browse around, go to the hardware store and get stuff? And oh, do sure. people bother you? Do people recognize you? What? How is it to be rock cuts in there? Well, you see, in Los Angeles, there is no element of uh, freakiness about being an actor because it's all over the place. When you go to an outlying area, like once I was in Buenos Aires a couple of years ago, and it was almost like, uh, the reaction was almost like the Beatles had arrived, if you remember <laughs> that six, seven, eight years ago. Yes. It was just like, like, almost like that. Does that, does that scare you? Well, it, it surprised me so. Really? I thought all that had been sort of forgotten, you know. But then Buenos Aires is a rather remote place on earth and people sort of don't go there passing through to get to where, Antarctica? You but, know. You, but you do live a, a reasonably normal life. Yeah. Uh, most people would think that you didn't, that you would have, I don't know what they think. They're always surprised, for example, at cabinet officers, you know, go to the store on Saturday and sure. go to grocery shopping sure. and, and uh, people in your same position. But you do. Sure, sure. And you can do it without being bothered too mm -hmm. much. Just another neighbor, huh? Okay, if you say so, Rock. That must be some neighborhood. Rock Hudson, thank you very much for being with us. We'll be right back. Next week on Montage, we'll show you some of your neighbors enjoying an exotic sport many of us dream about, but few of us ever get to try, gliding. We'll also see a clinic that treats children with cancer for free. And we'll meet world-famous violinist Daniel Heifetz. That's our montage for tonight. This is Ralph Rennick. Good evening.